Take out your Bible, if you would, or your electronic device, and turn and find John 7, verse 53. I hope when you look into your New Testament that you have a notation there. Uh, the ASV, the New American Standard, the RSV, the ESV, and the NIV, and those are the ones I'm aware of, make a notation. My notation is that the earliest and most reliable manuscripts do not include John 7, 53 through 8, 11. And we know that it first appeared in the 9th century and then it appeared in many translations in the 12th century. But until the 9th century, it was not a part of but one of the original manuscripts. The reason we believe is because it's an event that occurred, but it just wasn't included. And of course, only John's gospel includes it there. There are several places that it's included. In most of the newer translations, it's listed right here as you finish John chapter 7. It's an important set of verses. I'm thankful that we have them. I believe they occurred. I haven't read anything over the years that suggests it's not an event that occurred. And we know in John's Gospel, many things occurred that aren't written. And they would have filled a multitude of books. So that doesn't go against what we know as well. But it's one of those stories that's important for us to see and hear. It's important for us to put into context in this time, beginning in John 7, of this period of conflict. We're in the last six months of the life of Christ. He's in open conflict with the religious leaders. John's Gospel begins to give us more of their response rather than just his teaching. More and more we're hearing the debate among the Jews and among the religious leaders. And so that fits the context as well. I want to read all the verses, and then I want us to make some comments. Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, he said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. I attach to this the topic, if you will, not guilty, overcoming shame. Put yourself in each of the people's circumstance, it seems to me, to give us a good understanding about what's happening. First of all, John tells us very quickly that they're coming here hoping to trap him. And they brought this woman caught in adultery. And there's something that needs to be said, and I plan to say it a number of times in several different ways. Because they were trying to trap them, there's a strong understanding by most people that she was not a person caught in adultery. She was someone simply used by Jesus as a tool. And he certainly doesn't condone her life. He tells her not to sin at the end. 
But here he is with a woman there before him. John tells us they're trying to trick Jesus as they've done a number of times. The word test is also used. And the words that cry out, and every time we ever touch these verses, we need to cry out with a simple question, where is the man? Where is the man? When you read scripture, you know that these are things that occurred, and they had the right to offer some judgment, if you will, against a woman caught in adultery. Where is the man? If they caught her in the act, they also caught the man. He's not here. And we know from Leviticus 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. So very quickly, we're brought with the re reality here. This woman caught in adultery, according to the religious leaders, using the law of Moses as their guidance for suggesting something be done, and yet their heart is revealed to us by John, this is something they were doing to test him, to put him at a test, if you will, to catch him doing something he should not do. Now, they should have known the law. Jesus certainly knew the law. And so in trying to understand what's about to happen, we need to look at a few things and come to some common sense, simple conclusions. First of all, if he had suggested that she should be stoned, he would have been breaking the law. There was no man with her, and that was part of the law. If he had done something like that, giving in to pressure, if you will, he would have been a lawbreaker. That's not going to happen. We know that for certain. So that helps us to appreciate maybe what he does differently than what they supposed that he would do. I read someone a number of years ago in putting together some notes about these verses, and I saw some new renderings recently of someone who spent great detail talking about we serve a Savior who stoops. And when I first saw that, I thought for a moment, how is he going to proceed with that? Well, twice in this scripture, Jesus stoops and writes something on the ground. And it's foolishness for us to suppose that we have any idea if he was writing something factual or just scribbling, or that's just something that he did to draw attention not from her, but to him. Because they were waiting for him to do something. They wanted to catch him, if you will. But we serve a Savior who stoops. He goes to great lengths to try to understand and deal with circumstances that come up in our life. And in those occasions, the attention was drawn from her. Put, your, put yourselves in her circumstances for a moment. In a religious setting. If she'd just been a tool, not really caught in the act of adultery, as some suggest, Think of how they were using her in such a shameful way. If she was, she knows the man's also guilty. Where's he? Why is she the one only that's there? But put yourself in her shoes. And Jesus certainly wanted them to be in that circumstance as well. We know that his motives would have been honest and pure. We know that their motivation would have been against that because of what John tells us and because of what we've seen before. But let's talk about adultery for a moment. In the eyes of the Jewish law, adultery was a serious crime. And they believed that every Jew must die when he commits adultery, murder, or idolatry. And so the rabbis had a very high standard for this. It was one of the three most serious of sins. And certainly something deserving of death would put it in that high category. The dilemma was, where is the man? Where is the man? And when we can't answer, 
answer that question, we must begin to understand what was really taking place here. They were using this woman. If he had brought forth a condemnation that would bring about death, we know that it also would go against the Roman law because only they had the right to bring forth that punishment. It certainly had many areas of conflict brought into it for us as we see the circumstances. Listen to Jeremiah 17, verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. But that's offered to us because it has terminology that fits what's taking place. Is that where Jesus was wanting them to think? That their names were being written in dust because they've forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water? I don't know that we know that. But we do know that it's a verse that would be something related to what was taking place. And it required that the accusers cast the first stone, Deuteronomy 17, 7. The hands of the, wit of the witnesses must be the first in putting him to death. And then the hands of all the people, you must purge the evil from among you. And of course, the concept of a witness and the concept of those who saw it first would offer that first judgment and throw that first stone. And that's what Jesus is alluding to. On both occasions, he takes the pressure off, if you will, and takes it certainly away from her and stoops. And what I think we can see from that is he was trying to relieve some tension, but it was also a way for him to force them to be honest with themselves, for them to be honest with what they were doing. And when he did not quickly cooperate with that which they wanted to take place, then they began to see themselves. And I think Jesus wanted them to see themselves. And to their credit, those who were older, those oldest with more wisdom, more experience, those who would be most honest with themselves, were the first to walk away. Finally, no one was there. And so it certainly speaks to some of what Jesus accomplished. I want to read two other verses that help us to understand his asking the witness to step forward. Inferring that only as a witness could you cast that first stone. Deuteronomy 19 verse 16. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime... The two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priest and the judges who are in office at the time. And the judges must make a thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. Exodus 23, verse 1, Do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. Verse 6, Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the righteous. I think Jesus knew exactly what was taking place. He said just enough and it required just enough from them to put the scriptures before them if they wanted to put the scriptures before them. And certainly the first circumstance in place was for them to realize who's the wrongdoer here? Who is the one that's broken or is breaking the law? 
And certainly it shows us the cruelty and the, the terrible attitude of the Pharisees and scribes toward people. We know they look down on sinners. We know they wanted no time, no, no variance at all with their attitudes toward sinners. They constantly spoke down of Jesus because he spent time with sinners. Jesus, the Savior who stoops, says something to us. He says something to us. I made the comment in class similar because of things happening there. You know, we sometimes set people to a very high standard, suggesting that if you've ever done anything wrong, you can't ever from that point forward do anything right or good. And yet, we don't have that standard for ourselves. The standard begins first and foremost with us. How would you want others to treat you when you've made a mistake? When you've said or done something you regret? What's your attitude when you do it? And of course, do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a principle that applies in so many places. The reality is sometimes we want to catch someone and yet we certainly don't appreciate it when we've been caught. Our reaction is very different. Our actions are very different. And Jesus wanted them to see and to remember some of those things from Scripture as he would speak to them. God uses his authority to draw men to himself. To know by no person ever becomes a theme to God. Every person is an individual created in his being and in his likeness with a soul. He wants them for his own. And so everything he says and does toward any person, no matter what they've done, is something that can give them, first of all, that forgiveness to remove the shame and certainly to then remove the guilt. And it's a threefold process. I've shared with you before the, the man who sat, always sat in front of us when we were in Florida and the times when he would come forward he would feel so guilty because of some of the things he had said and done to his children. I'm sure he was impatient with them. Maybe he was a little harsh, probably yelled a little more than he intended and he just really, really, really regretted it and he would ask for prayers with some regularity. Help me to be a better father. Help me to be a better husband. And we would offer that. We would offer a prayer on his behalf. And I know many would pray for him over a long period of time without him asking us again. He was on their regular prayer list. But I got to where as I became more and more close to him, I would always say this after the prayer had offered that, I had been offered after we closed the assembly, I would call him aside and I would whisper, and I says, God has forgiven you. Others are praying for you. You forgive yourself. The guilt Satan will use to push us away. The guilt. The shame needs to be acknowledged. The shame can't be forgiven without God's involvement in it. But for some reason, the guilt tends to linger. And I think maybe that's why some of the things that are listed in these verses, some of the reactions, some of the actions, and certainly the final conclusion deals with that shame and that guilt, if you will, with this person. He treated her with dignity. He treated her with compassion. He treated her with frankness. He didn't pretend that there's things in her life that did not need to be discontinued. But his statements seemed to suggest that she had not been caught in the sin by which she was brought before them. And the reality is Jesus says, go and don't sin any longer. He dealt with her sin. He dealt with her shame. He dealt with the coming guilt if you will. And of course, that's what we say to people all the time. Come and acknowledge it. We're going to treat you with dignity and compassion and frankness. 
sometimes we find in circumstances like this, today we have many ways that we try to avoid confronting our own sin. We try to ignore it. I will not think about it. We try to deny it. I didn't do anything wrong. We sometimes try to justify sin. I did that because of my parents or my job or my culture. And the reality is he was very frank with her. And he treated her with grace and hope. I would hope every time we stand before others or sit to teach with others that we use those same standards. That the things we say and do are redemptive in nature. Very firm to the high standard that the scriptures gives us. But also very high to the standard of love. In our actions or reactions to those things around us. I've made the statement a few times in recent years. Because it's true. That sometimes someone will come. They'll say this is really serious, and I can tell it's really serious with their demeanor. And I'll tell them, as I say to any person who comes to me for study or counseling, nothing you say here will ever be repeated. It will never be shared. Secondly, if it needs to be shared, you'll know about it. Because there's some things I can't keep a secret. So we'll proceed if it's all right. But then I'll also encourage them to realize that there's nothing that you're going to tell me that I haven't seen or heard before. What? You're suggesting you've seen or heard of everything? I can tell you things that would just amaze you that I know of Christians doing. I know of people in congregations doing. That it involves the most serious of sins adultery among them, but a number of serious, serious things. But in every case, Scripture allows us to be frank, to treat someone with dignity, to acknowledge the sin, and to offer forgiveness. And to know that once God no longer remembers it, as difficult as it is for us, don't bring it to mind again. And sometimes you'll see people in a reoccurring circumstance. Now, you're bringing up something that God doesn't even remember any longer. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they'll say. But Satan wants us to hold on to those things. And the redemption is provided, it's received. And yet, Satan wants to turn us back in the guilt and to remember the shame, though it's been forgiven. And certainly, these verses deal with that. Think about that principle and I want to read you something that I came to appreciate greatly these last two weeks. Sometimes your shame is private, pushed over the edge by an abusive spouse, molested by a perverted parent, seduced by a compromising superior. No one else knows, but you know and that's enough. Sometimes it's public, branded by a divorce you didn't want, contaminated by a disease you never expected, marked by a handicap you didn't create, and whether it's actually in their eyes or just in your imagination, you have to deal with it. You're marked a divorcee, an invalid, an orphan, an AIDS patient. The list could go on and on. Whether private or public, shame is always painful. And unless you deal with it, it's permanent. Unless you get help, the dawn will never come. And that metaphor just simply says that new day. That sun rises and you look at yourself differently. It just won't ever come unless you get help. And Jesus says, I don't. I also don't judge you guilty. You may go, but don't sin anymore. Paraphrasing verses 10 and 11 here. If you've ever wondered how God reacts when you fail, 
frame these words and hang them on the wall. Read them often. Ponder them often. Drink from them. Stand below them and let them wash over your soul. Or better still, take him with you to your canyon of shame. Invite Christ to journey with you. Let him stand beside you as you retell the events of the darkest nights of your soul. And then listen. Listen carefully. He's speaking. I don't judge you guilty any longer. And watch. Watch carefully. He's writing, he's leading a message, not in the sand, but on a cross. Not with his hand, but with his blood. His message of two words, not guilty. Shame, guilt, are beneath these verses very strongly. I make a list sometimes of those things provided by God when we respond in a public way and eventually are immersed in water. We're told in Acts 2 38 that we're forgiven of our sins and other verses tell us that they're as numerous sometimes as we just can't number them. But they're as far on that occasion from the east as from the west. Forgiveness is everything we receive the indwelling gift of God. Part of God comes to dwell within us to remind us, to strengthen us, to guide us, to give us courage. There's a number of things that that Spirit does within us as Christians. One of the things we many times don't remember is given in Hebrews 10, verse 22. We're told to draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. So as baptized believers with our sins forgiven, oh by the way, walk in the light and you're continuously cleansed of that unrighteousness. Just walk with an awareness of right and wrong. Pray without ceasing if you will. Your sins are continuously washed away as you walk in the light as he is in the light. And you have that sincere heart in full assurance of faith. But that's not all. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. That's why I know those things are so important to be sure we say to those who Satan still uses our past shame to bring about that present guilt. We are cleansed from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed in pure water. He's definitely talking about the salvation process. And shame on us if we keep bringing up things that people have said or done when they've asked forgiveness from God. How dare us remember things that He doesn't even remember. But of course, we say that to ourselves most often. How dare me continue to remember those things that God has forgotten. Sometimes the standard we use for others, we need to look in the mirror and be sure we're using it with ourselves first. And then if we find things that need to be mentioned, things that others have done, look to yourself also. What have I done? What participation have I had in this? What have I done similar? How have I wanted to deal with it? All of those things come to mind. When you're there, when God is there with you, and when you're trying to deal with this guilt and shame in a way that is redemptive, and certainly that happens. I used to say, and my dad would laugh at me, he would say, Gary, when you get to heaven, those things won't matter. But after a study like this, I would sometimes say, I would love to know if that woman was one of those 3,000 souls who were immersed in water on the day of Pentecost. Was she one of those in that first five and 8,000 in that first short period of time who are now New Testament Christians when they went through those acts of spiritual cleansing? 
I would love to know. He'll say, Dad said it won't matter. Those things won't matter when you're there. I used to say, I'll get in line. I'll get in a long line to ask those questions of God or Paul or James or John. No, they won't matter. But I hope she was. I hope she took that respect and dignity and the things he the way he treated her contrasted with the religious leaders of her day and what they put her through unnecessarily because they were breaking the law if what they asked for had been enacted. I hope, I hope she learned from it and moved forward from it and lived the kind of life that God through Christ wanted her to live on that occasion. Don't sin any longer. Of course, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So don't continue endlessly in the sin that may be a part of your existence today. Whatever had brought her there on that day. Certainly this morning as we stand to sing a song of encouragement, if there's anything that we can do, elders are here, water can be drawn quickly, prayers offered, baptism gone through, prayers offered for those who've sinned and need encouragement, the guilt, the shame can be dealt with through God's Word, through prayer, through loving one another as we treat each other the way Jesus treated her. Let's stand and sing a song of encouragement.